Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. Uh, I'm Ashok Subramanian, one of your regular co-hosts, and I'm joined today by another one of your regular co-hosts, Dr. Rebecca Parsons. Hello, everybody. Rebecca Parsons, Chief Technology Officer for ThoughtWorks. Great. And today, uh, Rebecca and I are joined by Andrew Hamalaw. Uh, Andrew, do you want to introduce yourself to our to our listeners? Yeah, hello. Thanks, Ashok. And hi, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, I'm Andrew Harma Law. I'm a tech principal with ThoughtWorks based out of the London office in the UK. Yeah, great. Uh, and Andrew's speciality is architecture metrics. Uh, in fact, he's actually written a chapter on a on the O'Reilly book on architecture metrics. So uh, that's the topic of our podcast today. Maybe when we start, why don't we actually start by uh, trying to you know, get your definition of architecture metrics. Uh, so what is it that you mean? Like- That's a very good question, actually. So I think, so because so architectures themselves, there's a great variety, right? And, and at ThoughtWorks, we see lots of them, and I'm sure everybody listening has got the individual manifestation of anyone's architecture is is probably not what everyone wants it to be or aspires for it to be, but it's 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 probably what it is. And it's also probably very different from any other architecture. Maybe the styles or the aspirations of them could be fitted into various buckets, but there's a wide variety. And, and, and also, in my experience in IT, which has been quite a few years these days, there's always a fashion or a trend or a new way of doing things. So that means there's older ways of doing things and there's new ways of doing things and there's even newer ways which are coming. And so given that variety, the the the, the concept of the question of architecture metrics is is kind of interesting. It's like what do you what do you measure if there's that much variety to make sure that you're you're giving yourself because what you want from a metric is is something to guide where you're going and kind of let you know if you're doing the right thing or going in a in a positive direction. What would you count? And so, like you said, Ashok, we got challenged by this, my myself and the other authors of the chapters at, by O'Reilly to write down what we thought. All of the other authors came up with very different things. And I realized that from my perspective, because when, when I architect, the style that I think is most effective for the projects and the clients I work for is to have autonomous teams with a supporting architecture and a supporting kind of just supporting organization structure and everything to, to make teams empowered and autonomous and to be able to, to flow and deliver deliver software. So what I did was I actually picked the, the Accelerate Dora four key metrics because I've when I've set those up, I've seen them be super productive to let teams see if they are autonomous. And if they're not, then they can either change their team structures or whatever. But frequently it comes down to architecture. So are they able to deliver a stable product efficiently? Those metrics are really nice, and they're a good, a good kind of broad brush way of understanding if you're, if you're in the right direction or if you're not in the right direction, and maybe with whether you want to architect for testability or or decoupling or stability or continuous deployment and all of these kind of things. So that's kind of there's other flavors that are available, but that's why. So you you mentioned a few things in there. One was around uh, autonomous teams and. Sort of enabling, and you you also touched about well, actually, like most organizations either end up having a collection of different, you know, uh, systems over you know multiple eras, if you like, and and they all have their own particular architectural style. Uh, uh, so, so in effect, what you're what you're saying is you know really for for organizations to to work well, you found that autonomous teams are useful, and then these four key metrics are a good way of trying to measure them. Okay, so so your uh, like, how did you like? How do you almost come to this realization? Almost like like we good to get like uh, tell our uh, our listeners a little bit about your journey into the space. Yeah, sure. So so it was it was so it's kind of it was it's the classic. The be- one of the benefits of being at ThoughtWorks is we get to work do different things for different clients. So I I. A few, three years ago, four years ago, Accelerate, the book had been released and lots of people were reading it. The client CTO had read it. They were buying it for all of their staff. We, luckily, I just finished reading it before they started asking all of their, their people to read it. And so we we looked at the four key metrics, but didn't really do anything with it. But it was a really interesting lens to look through. To the extent that when I started on my next client project, just um, the last one before lockdown, we realized that we could start to kind of hand gather kind of hand raise our four key metrics. And, and we use that to 
not really to measure things, but more to 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 as a decision making aid. So that if we, you know, if we did this this thing and if we improved this or did this refactoring, or whatever, do we think it would have a positive impact on the Forky metrics? And then then the project after that, which was during lockdown, was where I actually I'd seen the benefit and we'd been trying these things and we tried it. So we thought, right, let's actually invest time and effort in setting things up. And that's actually the story behind the chapter, and I thank um, the client at the time, and, and luckily we can talk about the client. So the client was OpenGI in the UK. And so myself and my client pair, who was their tech director, I think it was called, Pete, we basically hand-rolled, we hand-created our own four key metrics, and then we built dashboards. But fundamentally, and this I think is the most important thing, we built dashboards which teams could consume and teams could look at and teams could see we reported the big picture of four key metrics, but the teams could then di- drill into that and say, what are the four key metrics for my team? What are the four key metrics for this pipeline? And, and, and ask questions and get answers. And the power being, they could do that. They could see where tight coupling or difficulty of testing or um, things which were, you know, test data making their lives difficult or environments, progression to environments or releasing or, you know, all of these things which some point come back to architecture. They could see that these were problematic. So the teams themselves were driving these initiatives. And up to that point, as a thought worker, I would be the person driving the initiatives. I'd be like, right, you're paying me to be here. I have this vision. This is where we should go. This is what we should be doing. But the four key metrics with given to the teams, they could see this. And they're like, okay, cool. We we all agree that we would like to, to deliver more frequently. We'd like to, you know, smaller increments and have more stable, observable systems. Then they took that back and went, okay, let's look at our code and see if it's the architecture or see if it's the release process. And when we cleared out the easy stuff, like adding more tests or, or whatever, all of it became about architecture. So that's where I was confident to submit this chapter to O'Reilly because, you know, we changed the organizational stuff. Like we've just, we just decide to release more frequently. As soon as you've done that, the marginal gains, the real kind of gains are, are in refactoring your code, making sure that teams really are independent, that that one story can be delivered by a single team and released via a set of one or more microservices. And and you could see it. You could step back and you could see the team speed up and they gained more empowerment and they gained the autonomy rose and the engagement rose and the satisfaction rose. And that in the midst of COVID, that was kind of cool to see, right? We We didn't sit in the same office as anyone else, but we could see this kind of shared understanding coming. And that's when I saw the power of it. So then since then, I've just kind of it's my go-to default for setting stuff up and showing teams where they are and, 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 and where they want to be, what they might do to fix it. And I realize we've uh, been talking about or we've been referencing the four key metrics and uh, not all of our listeners might necessarily be you know, aware of all of that, so, uh, of what they are. So, so perhaps uh, a, a, you know, if you could just quickly give an overview of of what the four key metrics are and maybe why why ultimately it was sort of distilled down to those four four ones. Yeah. So that's a good you know, it's a very good point. So um so the four key metrics come from originally so it comes from the DevOps community and 2016, I think, or maybe um, Dr. Nicole Fosgren and Gene Kim and Jez Humble started writing something called the State of DevOps Report or the DORA. State of DevOps report. And they were just, they were looking at, they wanted to, to do something statistical and, and, and really look in detail at all of these practices, which everyone kept, you know, the DevOps community had started to talk about and were advocating. And they seemed to be having positive impacts, but nobody had actually gone in and really had a look and prove things. So they did a load of work, statistical, deep, hardcore statistical work to prove this. They did surveys. They, they, they I think there's something like 23,000 respondents and stuff. They gathered loads of data and every year they would update this thing. And they realized that these practices did have a positive impact on not just commercial performance of companies, but non-commercial performance, so employee satisfaction, quality of product, et cetera. And they realized that the ways to find out how good you were at these things, they could distill down to four metrics. And those metrics were the four key metrics, which are deployment frequency, uh, lead time for changes, uh, mean time to recovery, and change failure rate. And so kind of if if they 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 proved statistically that if you if you improve these, it, Across the board, you can't just improve one, but you need to improve all. You know, I can make my, 
I can make my lead time for changes it, a lot better by just turning off all my tests, but then I'll obviously impact my the stability of my service. So I've got to keep my service stable, but I want to you know deliver more frequently and, and deliver um, more rapidly. So if I keep them all balanced and I do that, do those things, and I optimize for those four key metrics, then I should be moving towards being efficient at delivering a stable product. It doesn't say that I'm delivering a product that customers want. That's those are entirely different metrics, but the metrics for the machine of of or not machine the the the, the craft room of the teams building and shipping this software, it's a very good indication of all of those kind of things. And so, for, as a consultant, it's it's a gift, right? It's a proven, a proven set of methodologies and practices with with strong statistical work behind the scenes that, that Dr. Fosgren's done. So it's um, it's super useful. So one one thing that occurs to me, though, and um, and you sort of alluded to it um, when when you mentioned those would be other metrics, like whether or not what you're building is actually what what people want. The four key metrics assume nothing about what the actual requirements of the system are. It, it really is all about just, are you able to effic- efficiently and effectively deliver a product into production and getting it into the hands of, of, of your users? How do you go about thinking about other kinds of metrics that might be more tailored to the particular application. Perhaps it's, you know, something that requires low latency or something that requires um, five nines of reliability, you know, or, or, or do you just start with the four key metrics and and they then say, okay, now, now let's move on. We, we, we've got, we've got a stable platform and we've got a working organization. Now I can start worrying about these other architectural concerns. So that's a very good question. So typically, in my experience, and this, but this, so caveat, maybe this is just the clients that I've worked with and and the and the work that that comes to us as thought works. Typically, the things, the, the 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 work and the organization and the kind of focusing that would have the biggest impact at the start is around about just getting software out the door. But maybe that's the project that I get staffed on. Maybe that's because thought works UK think that that. I can I can advocate for this stuff quite well, and then then when we're getting stuff out the door, then we can focus on other stuff. So, for example, at OpenGI, there was also parallel pieces of work where they were focusing on. There were certain because they were an, uh, an insurance broker and they were moving to a multi-tenant cloud version of their application. So they knew quote um, from their business model and from their existing customer base, they knew, for example, that performance of quotes and availability of the quoting system would be a big deal. So there was a parallel piece of work to set things up around that and to set up um, some performance testing and availability testing and also to to set that up kind of continuously. They didn't just want to do one and done because they knew that they were moving to a product mindset. They knew they wouldn't build something and leave it. They would build it and iterate on it and keep going. You know, maybe they build something that's fast and they test it and it's fast, but then they add three years worth of features which slowly degrade the performance or degrade the availability. So they wanted to build capabilities to test those kind of things. And especially, I mean, they had a. It's it's there's probably a U.S. equivalent or a, other country equivalents. There was a there's a there's a person in the U.K. who um, called Martin Lewis who has a TV show every now and then on the TV, and it's basically he t- tells you how to save money, and he will tell you if you go to this insurance broker, they will give you a really good deal. So this is effectively he would DDoS their servers every time he would do a show. So they would if if explicitly when they were on prem they would they would spec out more servers when they saw his tv show coming up in the schedules because they knew it would be bad so we did look at that and they looked at that they looked looked at that far far more detail and 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 spent a lot of time worrying about it so that was kind of like a product metric and uh and a te- another technical metric because they knew they knew that that throughput and and within some certain response time was going to be key for clients, but also that 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 it could cope with the load and that it could cope with also being elastic because provisioning that much, you know, if they're moving to the cloud, they don't want to pay for that much infrastructure underneath the quoting engine all the time. They just want it to be there and be able to scale up elastically when Martin Lewis does one of his TV shows. So we did, we still had the four key metrics, but what was nice was, and it was at the start, it was clear that Lots of stuff around about the quoting engine was tightly coupled because of the old architectural decisions, which weren't wrong. They just were. They would scale up a lot of things because they couldn't individually scale just this individual piece. 
So part of the four key metrics was to be able to get that team to be able to slice out their piece of the of the infrastructure and to then work to be able to continue to deliver that piece. And then they could deliver it. So we weren't so worried about them being able to put that kind of stuff into production, but we did want to get them to be able to rapidly do experiments and then, you know, deliver something to a test environment. Then they could soak test it, see what really happened to it and, and do that stuff. So again, building for things where you could, you can ship multiple increments very rapidly on demand and be able to have something that's stable and that you're confident in with good observability and, and all these other things that enabled lots of the other things that they were doing. And that was key. So they could see, and to be fair as well, Rebecca, right? I think the um, the exec on the tech side probably cared about the um, the four key metrics, but I think the rest of the exec, like chief product owner and, and CEO and stuff, probably didn't. Like you shouldn't, they shouldn't care. They, they should care if it sucks. Like why are tech in the way? Why why can't my product people come up with ideas and then ship it rapidly? But as soon as we got out of their way, then they're just like, okay, good. Now I need to make sure the product people have found the right market fit and have found the right business model and have found all of these kind of things. So, but it was nice. And and again, the kind of final thought is, it was nice to get things set up in a way that that they could start shipping stuff. They did when we left because um, uh, we were just there for a specific period of time, but they kept going and they've recently released. They were definitely able to kind of keep delivering all of this stuff to the extent that I spoke to the C. CTO or so I can't remember they if that's their title. Spoke to, to one of the senior exec members of, of OpenGR recently and they'd actually they'd slowed down on some of their four key metrics because it turned out that that was not the blocker, it was that product were doing nice, you know, once find product market fit and all of these kind of things. So they'd they were deinvesting in this stuff because it had paid off and now they were investing in other things. So and that's nice to be able to get IT to respond to the needs of the business as opposed to not get in the way of the business was quite a refreshing place to be. So, I think the uh, maybe that's something we can uh, dive into a bit more detail a bit later. You mentioned product metrics, so maybe that's something you know I'll keep aside to to come back a bit later in the uh, 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 as we discuss. <clears throat> I in what you what you sort of described, there are a few things in in there you spoke about almost as a positive benefit or side effect or like you know, some of these things didn't, will happen. Like one of the things you spoke about was scaling and you mentioned both scaling the technology, but using these four key metrics to almost like see whether you're making progress. You mentioned earlier on, uh, I think when you sort of describing, you mentioned about autonomy of teams and so on. I, I think one of the things that we see quite often is... Uh, the approach to architecture can sometimes be seen as uh, uh, almost adversarial sometimes, depending on how organizations are set up between architectural, you know, teams that have more responsibility or focus on architecture and teams that are sort of, you know, you just go and deliver stuff. Is there, uh, is you know, are there any other benefits that you've seen where actually, you know, both everyone starts caring? Like you, the way you sort of describe it, it almost it felt like you were saying, well, this is the only thing you sort of measure and then everybody somehow magically sort of falls in line. Is that is that what happened? So you're right. It doesn't magically fall in line. It's There's an awesome, which which exercised my brain for years. There's an, there's an Alberto Brandolini quote. So Alberto Brandolini, the, the, the person behind event storming. And I think it's something like, although I'm going to get it wrong, what ships to production is the developer's assumption of what they're supposed to be shipping to production. You know, the person who writes the code is that's what gets into prod. It's not the architect's picture of what's there or whatever. You know, and maybe the architect's picture has been effectively, you know, they've they've co co designed with the developer or the developer is the architect or all these kind of things. But what goes into prod, the architecture that's manifested and and um various thought workers have talked about this as well. That's what ends up in production. So and I think this is I was talking to another colleague about this yesterday. Setting up the four key metrics alone won't get you there. And I think the thing that we did most was every week we would sit down with with all the – it was an open invitation, so not every member of every team came, so that would be the most expensive meeting in the universe. But but people from all the teams plus people from key representatives from like InfoSec, from product used to come along, sometimes the chief uh, – not chief exec, sometimes the, the exec and tech would come. And we would do things and we, we would look at – ADRs that were moving through the system 
to kind of get an understanding of architecture. But also we would look at our four key metrics and our cloud spend, and we would discuss what was going on openly and with the team. And it wasn't like the architects were having a discussion or the people who were blessed with seniority. It was an open conversation around about what is, where are we? What could we improve? What, you know, is this the right amount of money to spend? Is this the wrong amount of money to spend? Is this, is this an acceptable level of four key metrics, right? You don't want to over-optimize or, or would we benefit from making, trying a new practice, like trying trunk-based delivery, right? Some teams realized that trunk-based delivery was for them so they could pick up that practice. Other teams realized because some testing, the shape of data in, in, in insurance, but also in banking and other industries is, is complicated and can have significant impacts on performance. So some teams invested in big pieces of work to do to build realistic test data and do test proper test data management. So all of these things they kind of let us let us look at things. So like for example, if we wanted to do nice testing with a stable predictable product, we would say, okay, let's for this team that was doing all of this performance testing, it makes sense for them to invest in some test data setup stuff. So they built some services to to, to do all of these kind of things. Other teams, it was very simple. So they just had CRUD type stuff, so they didn't didn't bother. But what was nice because we centered the conversation was we were getting the concerns and the fears and the broader, bigger picture from the architects or the people who had the cross view. But you also got an equal weight of the conversation from people who are just trying to ship code. And they're like, right, it's taking me too long to do this. This architecture is stopping me. If I thin slice a story, I've still got to wait for two other teams to deliver two pieces. So we could look at re-architecting and we could, we could get that feedback loop even before we deployed stuff. We could hear from people and hear what it was like. And that was a really powerful conversation. So then, and then, and then we get the engagement and therefore people want to understand. So I, I, in my opinion, my impression was that, that what ended up in prod was a lot closer because it was co-designed. It was a lot closer to what everyone was hoping would be there as opposed to some aspirational PowerPoint slide deck that, Someone produced three years ago at the start of the project. So, so almost, the start of the almost a beneficial side effect of getting like actually having sort of yeah. collective ownership. It's of almost, that. yeah, the, the metrics almost fade into the background. At some point, everybody, the big thing is everyone, and this is what I spend half of my chapter doing and half of the talk when I talk about this. There's a mental model behind the four key metrics, which is is the kind of the lean, the pipeline, the, the, the single piece flow, the kind of, you know, starting from... In the four key metrics, it starts from kind of check-in or, or development complete down to running in production, but not necessarily released. And it's easy to forget as a consultant, not everybody has that, that mindset. Lots of people have the, I've been given a story, so I write it and I write some tests and then I stop and I'm done. And then a QA picks it up and then they do, and then, they, then they're done and then a release team releases it. And then a support team supports it. By having an end-to-end -end model, lots of stuff, that conversations that would be segregated and siloed suddenly become kind of cross conversations and people are, are, are aware of it and care about it. And that has a big impact in my experience because not everybody's used to that. Some people are like, that's a, that's obvious. That's such a default. Why are you even telling me this? But I never fail to be surprised that because I didn't start off with my career with that mindset. I started off with the, you given a requirement, you implement the requirement and then you're done. So at some point people go through this change. And I think that getting that and mapping that onto your lived experience and then figuring out how to improve that mental model is key because that's the power. So, you know, we can build and release software to the cloud very cheaply and very rapidly these days. So we should optimize for that to help discover products and to help evolve products and to help to, you know, right size our systems and all those kind of things. And if we're not taking advantage of that, then that's a big problem. I think when you were describing uh, like like this journey and you just you know you're talking about how you know all the things the teams have to do to make sure you can like deliver this fast you you also touched on um you know just so that to be clear right, there's a number of other practices that are almost necessary or underpinning this that sort of are going to end up supporting whatever you define as the thresholds you want to achieve in the four key metrics but like you need those enabling practices right yeah well you don't need them you're just your four key metrics won't be very good and then if you adopt them so there's things like lean product management is one of the big boxes in the of kind of groups of, of of practices 
The other one is lean, lean project management, lean product management. Then there's all the kind of agile DevOps practices, which thought workers will, you know, given 15 seconds, we'll start telling you about whether we like, whether you ask for it or not. But then there's also, I mean, in later iterations of the Dora State of DevOps report and in the book Accelerate, they also realized that there's some, there's, I think there's something to do with leadership, some form of, Again, if if you have all of these things in place, but leadership haven't given people the the or people don't feel like they have the permission to improve things, they won't improve things. They'll sit and wait to be, you know, be told to do it. And I think lots of what, because I firmly believe in autonomous teams, I think but half the time I just I just crash in and build. You know, I, autonomy isn't just like you have few dependencies and and this bit belongs to you and this bit belongs to someone else. Autonomy is the ability and the desire to pick that up and use that to improve your piece and improve your metrics, your product metrics, not your, you know, your forky metrics. And to understand the, you know, empathy for the customer, which is, is a thought worker once impressed on me. You know, the two things about microservices are you can release independently and you should have empathy for the customer, the consumer of your, of your service. And I was like, oh, that's quite a nice summary. If you have that, then you can then you can you've got this feedback loop from the consumer whether that's another team or an end customer or whatever then you've got this build measure learn loop and you've got the empathy and you're you're right sizing your product and you care and and all of these kind of things it's uh, really i mean the way you sort of describe it that's it's great right it's like you know everybody would want to be there uh, but we know like effectively you, you said at the start yourself right You've got, you know, systems across multiple eras and so on. You've got different styles, potentially different, you know, approaches to solving problems as well. So if, if you want to actually start on trying to go down this journey, when or how do you start? Like what is the, you know, what would, you know, based on uh, the, you've seen this across a few different organizations, what what works yeah. and what doesn't work. So I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about this a real lot, actually. Because um, I've... It's very easy to do things that make it, have a, make things change and change positively, but it's harder to find the thing that will have the biggest positive impact in the biggest direction and set up and enable future changes. So the... And this may just be because I've been very lucky to work with some awesome BAPO, a product manager type people. But I think... Identifying your first valuable thinly sliced stories and then using that to drive through to find the things which are blocking you being able to, to, to deliver in this way and architect in this way and organize your teams in this way and, and observe your running system in this way and build, to build this feedback loop with your end customer. If you don't have a valuable story, everything else feels a bit secondary. So the key thing is, you know, like a really nice thin, really small story but with known or at least a hypothesis of value, then you can push that through, and then and 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 you will have to push it through because, like you say, people, you know, the the world of IT is not we're not all living in in this glorious future of you know which we imagine Silicon Valley to look like, but which isn't. But because you know it's as bad, it's as messy there as it is anywhere else, right? But we all think it's amazing, and people at you know Twitter can ship in thirty seconds after they've got their foot in the door, but. But so you have to you have to convince people and you have to change minds and you have to 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 change mindsets and stuff. If you have a valuable story, you can say, right, but if we if this one thing gets in, or even this hypothesis, this experiment, if we prove we can release this little thing, you can take product with you, you can take tech with you, you can bring all of these things through and you drive that through, and you probably make compromises and you probably have to go slower than you want to, and you probably have to, you know cut corners and cheat. I mean, there's loads of bits in, uh, not loads of bits, but there's a few bits in the, in the chapter in the book as well, where um, like at OpenGI, we weren't, we weren't actually releasing to production. We were going to do a big bang release at the end. So we faked it, right? We weren't even in production. Technically our lead time was infinite as one person joked, but we were confident we were doing the right thing because we were treating our highest environment as prod. So if it failed or if testers couldn't test something or if something, you know, if there was a defect, we treated it like it was a defect in production. We dropped, we stopped the line, all of the kind of, you know, the and on core type stuff. And we, we went around and fixed it. So we, we kept ourselves honest, even though we knew we were cutting corners. 
And so that's the kind of thing. And 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 um, I've spoken to other people as well. other clients. We've done things like with where you release a a mobile app. My previous my client before my current one, they had a mobile app, and they pointed out as you, you know, I can I can go as fast as I want, but the Apple i Store is not going to release my code any faster than they choose to, which is true. So you can't, right? So we were like, okay, cool. So your prod is when you've submitted something to to Apple. And then a, and a and a change failure is if Apple give you a knockback because you're you know you're using too much CPU or you've used the, you've used the the volume button as a camera you know to take a photograph or you know any of the rules that you might have broken that 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 Apple will will push back on because we're taking it to the point where you think you're done that's the kind of the end the the deployment point is I should have not I should have no more recourse to do anything else an extra and if you do that it's a change fail right and then you've you've failed so. And I think that's it. And I think it comes back to value. So if you can say, right, this thing, this one thing, which is hard to find, and you, I end up spending quite a lot of my time at the start of projects these days, peeling stuff back to find a little thing that's useful, and then you can you can push it through. And then you can say, right, okay, let's do that. But then there's some stuff we, we compromised on. Let's push through another one. And you can incrementally build it up. So that's that's how I do it. There's probably other ways of doing it, but... It helps to have a to have a debate with someone if you've got a valuable business thing to argue about. Because if it's just around some random thing nobody cares about, then the skin's not in the game. So, so try and take some as many thin slices through the system all the way through, or as far down it. Yeah, and like in like classic agile terminology, right? Like aspirin use cases or tracer bullets or something a bit less military. But you know what I mean? Like aspirin use cases are nice, one, right? Because so the first one I got told about was. Yeah, what's what's the simple? If I'm building a hyper complicated system which prescribes drugs to people, what's the simplest thing I can prescribe which will give bring value to end users? Lots of people take aspirin, and prescribing aspirin to a person who has no other drugs that's a useful thing. Pushing that through, it's not you know build the label printing service and then build the mobile front end for the blah blah blah. It's like prescribing aspirin, simple. And then, then you can then you can get people behind it, and their the mindset is beginning to be value and customer and things like that. So, but maybe I've been brainwashed by BAs. Maybe I should be. Maybe I'm saying the wrong thing. Maybe I should be like we should build awesome Kafka based microservices. Yeah, I think maybe it's a good time to circle back into uh, and talk about the product metrics that we talk about. And I think that is uh, you know that's something that we have spoken about as well. I know discussions on on things like well when do you know sort of your you're sort of done with this like you know is this a is this are these architecture metrics a useful tool or are they like a a stepping stone or i think there was a reference you made about well actually we don't want to be pushing to production at one of our clients we don't want to push to production too often because that is uh, you know counterintuitively maybe that's bad Right. So, uh, so what's the you know where do you see this? Uh, like, is this like a stepping stone to getting better? And when do you sort of realize that actually maybe that's you stop focusing on this a bit more and focus on like the product entry? Exactly. I, yeah, I think so. It's a tool, and it's and I think the tool's most powerful when everybody knows how to use the tool, and so that's how I use it. I don't use it as a which is, as a consultant, you, I've got to be careful when I come in because some people are like, well, he's setting up metrics and that feels like he's going to use it to judge us and mark us. That's, that couldn't be further from the truth, but but I'm aware of that. And and again, Accelerate the book is is branded on on Amazon as a mark as a sorry as a management book, which it isn't. It's a practical book for people to 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 adopt a mindset and 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 some tools and practices and ways of working. Um, but it is a tool. So when you don't need the tool, then you get rid of the tool. Um. And and so it's interesting. I've read a blog post because I spoke about this about this four key metrics at XConf last week, and someone came up to me at the end, <clears throat> and they shared with me an article that someone had written. And fundamentally, the, the, and it was critiquing the four key metrics. And I've read a few other ones as well. Fundamentally, most of them that, that critique them kind of say, "Yeah, but all of this stuff is obvious. Why do I have to optimize for this? Why am I measuring it? it seems like a lot of effort for very little gain." Those articles, in my opinion, are written from the perspective of someone who doesn't need the four key metrics because they're already doing most of the stuff that the four key metrics would help them get to. So if they're already doing it, it's overhead. Why are they, you know, why are they doing it? And and but but where you want to get to and how 
you know, when are you done with the 4K metrics? Depends on your product. It depends on your customers. It depends on where you are in your life cycle. So very interestingly, I think I mentioned a minute ago, I caught up recently with John and Pete who are at OpenGI. They've, they've realized, number one, that different parts of their legacy product suite have different sweet spots for the 4K metrics. And some of them, because some of the stuff they produce is like thick clients, which they need to release to customers and customers install it. So every time they release a new version of something, a customer has to go off and install a bunch of stuff on a bunch of Windows 95 desktops, probably not Windows 95, but, you know, something like that. So they don't, you know, that's, <clears throat> there's, and there's no, they, the customer doesn't want them to install some fancy whiz bang auto update, you know, they just don't need it. So therefore they get to the point where they can have what they want and then they keep it there. Other teams, they want to go super fast. They can release behind release toggles. It's go crazy. You know, when I left, some of the teams were deploying Easter eggs because they were so comfortable. They were like at Christmas, Pete, like this wasn't thought workers. This was the client. If you, if you hit a certain URL, you would get Christmas lights on your, on your, on your web UI. And that's then that's, the, but then they, because they can, they've got full control and they could do this stuff and, and everywhere in between. And this was the kind of thing, it, what was interesting and John's, the, the, so he was the exec, kind of the more senior to Pete. His big point was when you get to that point, you can't compare, you can't lump all of your 4K metrics into one set, you know, four numbers, because you will obscure things. You'll, you'll, you'll hide the variation, which is important. You'll make some people think they need to optimize beyond where they should optimize. You give some people permission to slow down when they maybe shouldn't slow down and they could still speed up. So in that that's not in the book. This, you know, the, this, so the, the implementation of the 4K metrics at OpenGI is now really mature. And, they're, and again, they're using it as a tool. The teams are happy, they're comfortable with it. And they're using that as a way to make sure, to right size and kind of focus their engineering organization to be in the right place for the products that they're doing at whichever point they are in the life cycle. And that was kind of exciting. I was like, I hadn't even thought about that before. But that's, they were like, what are our metrics? What do we care about? Right, we care about customers being able to, to, request quotes or sell, sell, you know, app, upload new products to the platform and all this kind of stuff. And they could do that without having to release 20 times a day. Awesome. Don't release 20 times a day. So is it almost like, uh, it's almost like, you know, this is in some ways a useful, a useful tool or metric, like most metrics. Uh, but then once you reach, like, I think the Dora, you know, metrics or reports sort of call them elite organization. I suppose once you become elite, then you, yeah, you sort of know, you sort of know when you don't know. You've gone beyond elite. When you become elite, you're so, yeah, you're so elite. You don't even know you're elite anymore. You forget about the 4K metrics ever existing. I think it is. I think that's it. I think because elite, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure they didn't do this on purpose, but elite feels like something aspirational. Maybe not these days in this world, actually. But but you know, it feels like oh crikey, I've reached the you know, I've reached the top. But then yeah, I think when you get to the top, you're like okay, cool. Maybe I should actually take my foot off the gas a little bit and 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 focus. Hopefully, people are you know like and I say OpenGI and other clients focus on the product metrics well before they get to elite. You can be you can get out of the way of product delivery well before elite. But at that point, you're kind of, you know, you're, you've, the practices are embedded, the culture is set up, the, 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 you know, the build, measure, learn, the single piece flow, all of the kind of lean mindset type things, which are fundamentally basically moving towards the culture of learning, the culture of sharing, and all the DevOps stuff, like breaking down boundaries and safety and all of those kind of things. I think by this point you get to that, then hopefully you're, you're, you're coming up with your own stuff because it's interesting the book isn't prescriptive it just goes these things are proven to improve these things but in 20 years time, like half of them are what's the current fashion in 20 years time we'll have come up with some other thing quantum computing will be here and all of the rules will have changed right but but i think things like shipping valuable product to customers and getting their feedback from that product and using that to iterate i don't think that'll change maybe the tools maybe the you know the languages we use and and where we run stuff will change, but that well, feels I, like a I kind do of think constant. though there is value in continuing to track these. Perhaps not continue to try to improve them. I've, I'm I'm definitely with, with you on that. In part, just to provide that reassurance that backsliding isn't occurring, because it, like any change, it takes a while to get that bedded in. And if you have new people coming in and 
and you know, new requirements coming in and, and you might see some of those things degrade and it's, it's, it's helpful to, to know that they're there. Um, but, but I, I'm, I, I, I like the emphasis on, you know, d- deciding what is the right level for these metrics, for these individual circumstances. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I too find the elite, um, wording, it, it does seem to, to set that up as, as aspirational. And in some instances, it's more important than you, that you can do something, not that you do it. Um, and I, I remember having a conversation with, with an internet service provider who said, I don't need to worry about continuous delivery. You know, I'm not delivering any functionality. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm providing systems. Is it okay? You know, wouldn't you like to know how long it would take you to roll out a security patch to the operating system on a zero day? <laughs> and he said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I do think there is something, even if you're not going to aspire to the, to the elite level of doing it, knowing that you could, that you do have, a, have the infrastructure uh, in, in place to make it happen. To, to, to me, that's very important. That's exactly it. And this is what's interesting. So that's, that's very important, Rebecca, because if you look at elite and you get to deployment frequency, it doesn't keep going up. It goes blah, 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 brat or slash on demand. So it's like we're only deploying three times a year. But like you say, it's like some zero, you know, like Log4J is, 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 is another gigantic security hole in it. So they want to go and rapidly do, do it, deploy it. And um, meantime to recovery again, the key thing is knowing that something is broken so you can fix it because so there's something that's always weird. It's like change failure rate elite is 15%, which still confused. I understand. Excuse me. I understand. I've read the book, but the point is, is so it's zero to 15% for, I think the, the, for like medium high and elite or something. And people always go, but that's insane. Why, why is it not getting any better? And the point is they've realized that, that by doing the analysis, there's a lot of variation. Some people want, you know, like you, we see it, right? When you you hit your web service provider or something, and you you know you hit you hit. If you use Google enough, you'll get the broken arm robot. Or if you use Gmail enough, you'll you know something will break. Or if you use Netflix, sometimes the stream will break and then it'll come back and all this kind of stuff. So obviously, because they want they've they've made a trade off between being too careful, you know, like Netflix talks about anti fragility and all this kind of stuff, right? Failures will happen, so they don't want to over optimize for zero failures because that's a that's a false economy. But they do want to optimize for crikey, we broke it, we need to get this thing fixed fast, and that's key, like you say. And then you get to that point, and that's that's where you want to be. That's the you know your business value in things, and that's predictability and 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 all those kind of things, and and that. So it's like avoiding control, but but giving you the possibility to do things that you want. I think that's the. I think with what with what described there is the interrelationship almost between some of them between you know how fast can you deploy versus how quickly can you recover, but also, you know these are all I suppose gui- you know guidelines or thresholds that you you set and then you go and reevaluate at every time. Maybe that's the other, you know, aspect of you know, you know any. Uh, you know, guidance that if at all is, you know, you said these ones, but as Rebecca was saying, you also look at, the, I suppose the trend is a lot more valuable to look at than the absolute number at a point in time. And this is actually, so the thing we talk about it a little bit in the book, but after I wrote the chapter, I read Working Backwards, the the, the book about how Amazon work. And there's a really interesting bit in there, which I shared with Pete, because Pete's still obviously at, at working at OpenGI. And they were talking about how they visualize their data because they have metrics all over the place at Amazon, right? So how they visualize their data and what was really, one of the things they shadow plot, and Pete now has the ability to do this, they plot this time last year against right now. So we, and so Pete and I would plot the last 30 days for lead time. Pete now has enough data. I don't know if he's done it, but we were talking about it. We said it maybe not as important as for Amazon, but like to shadow plot this time, this month last year, or this 31 days last year to show the improvement or to show that it's the same or to show that, you know, before Christmas, we do lots more deploys. If you have all of this data, you can do some super smart stuff. And so Pete, and another reason why I kind of advocated in the chapter and in the talk for building your own, you can get loads of things like ThoughtWorks have metric, which we, 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 um, 
uh, provides to do 4 key metrics. There's Google 4 keys. There's a million plugins for Azure DevOps and Jen Jenkins and all this kind of stuff, or not Jenkins, uh, Jira. Um, but the benefit Pete and I got from rolling our own was we could collect the data in our own format and then we could interrogate it for tons and tons of stuff. And when we had these discussions on a weekly basis, questions would come up from developers and they were good questions. And we were like, we don't know. So then it was like an RFI to the dashboard and we go away and create, add extra things to the dashboard. I get like product development, right? They're like, oh, I've got a question. I've got a need. I want to know, you know, what's the 95th percentile for this? Well, I don't know. We'll find out because we have the raw data and we could put it up. The other interesting thing that, that Rebecca's question made me think, things that, the thing I like I liked most about the Simeon Army and Netflix and, and the Chaos Monkey and all those kind of things, which nobody ever talks about, but it goes back to meantime to recovery. And there's a blog post again that someone's kind of they're like, you know, meantime to recovery is nothing because it's just it's basically the time it takes to deploy. 99.9% .9 of, of clients and I think customers, the, the the time taken in meantime to recovery is not writing the code to fix it, delivering it to production. It's noticing it's broken. It's turning panic into action. It's finding the right person to do the right thing at the right time and arranging it and deploying stuff. And again, that's what Simeon, the reason they do, the reason I believe they do most of the Simeon Army stuff and the, and the chaos engineering at Netflix is to normalize failure. That's what you want. That's to get, you know, to remove the, the panic time in the, in the meantime to recovery, to just shrink the human being carnage down to like, oh, problem fixed. Da, da, da. That's the kind of thing. And I think that's why Again, that's what you want to optimize for, right? So it made me smile because I was just reminded me of the time that I think Rebecca and I were on a on a fairly large program of work where uh, I think it was uh, for a large retailer. There was there was a, there was an outage, and we were trying to figure that out. And actually, the like figuring out what was causing the outage was the thing that took the time. Actually, fixing it was fairly trivial. It was almost like, well, you just need to switch off that till. And, uh, and yeah, absolutely. Just trying to trying to bring some more clarity to to that is quite uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I've got a lightning talk called uh, "Turning a Crisis into a Drama," which was the, the the theory was like nobody likes an escalation, but if you treat it like instead of turning a drama into a crisis, if you make it fun, then at least people will have you know. So like, I use like disaster movies as the um, like everyone likes going to the cinema to watch disaster movies, right? So what if we treated treated escalations like disaster? It was tongue in cheek because obviously you shouldn't treat an escalation like a disaster movie, but it is. It's the drama that gets in the way, right? It's the it's the emotions and the lack of clarity and the confusion and stuff. It's not the changing the code and pushing it to source control and watching the build run. It's everything else. Cool. That's brilliant. Was really entertaining. I think we started with the four key metrics and ended with disaster movies. I'm sure it's going to make an interesting episode for our listeners. Uh, so yeah, so thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, it's really great having you and uh, chatting about architecture metrics. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Ashok. Thanks, Andrew. On the next episode of the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast, I will be joined by Prem, one of our co-hosts, and. Gautam and Jayanta, who are going to talk to us about EpiRust and Bharat Sim, both are agent-based simulators uh, used primarily in epidemiology, uh, but you'll hear a whole lot more about it on the next episode. Thank you.